I'm Selma Schimmel at the 33rd San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium where our discussion continues with Dr. Bill Gratishar. Dr. Gratishar is the director of the Maggie Daly Center for Women's Cancer Care at uh, the Robert H. Leary Comprehensive Cancer Center where he's also a professor in the Division of Hematology Oncology. That's at Northwestern University in Chicago. Hello. Hello and thank you for uh, having me. Thanks for spending some time because you're going to talk to us about some of the studies that you think are of real significance coming out of this meeting. Yeah, it's been an interesting meeting. There's been sort of an eclectic mix of things that I think have uh, potential clinical application either now or very soon. Uh, some stuff that's very positive, some that's perhaps a little more disappointing. Uh, one trial that was just uh, probably in the last hour presented was the Azure trial, something that we've been waiting for for probably the last year and a half. And that's a trial that looked at what contribution bisphosphonates make to the therapy of women with early stage breast cancer. There's been this notion that bisphosphonates, drugs like zoledronic acid, might have an anti-cancer effect and complement the effects of uh, other therapy that we routinely give. And one trial actually demonstrated that. The Azure trial was meant to be a trial that hopefully would support that previous observation. And Dr. Rob Coleman discussed the results of that trial just uh, an hour ago. And what it demonstrated is that when uh, standard therapy, be it chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, whatever, was administered to patients, or the same, plus zoledronic acid, which is a bone builder, is administered, there was no clear advantage for the addition of zoledronic acid. So this is in contrast to what the prior study showed. And you know, there's a lot of um, uh, further evaluation of the data that I'm sure will be undertaken to try and understand it. But the first glance was that there wasn't an improvement in uh, the time until the disease progressed. There was an improvement in survival. But there was an interesting observation that the effect, if present, may be restricted to women who are postmenopausal. And it raises the issue if this drug is most effective in women with a low estrogen environment, in other words, postmenopausal women. So again, we just have a quick look at the data a while ago, but the first blush is that it may not complement, as we hope, the prior trial. And the implication, of course, is that we've been waiting for this because if it would have been positive, I think there would have been a great deal of enthusiasm for more routinely using bisphosphonates as part of adjuvant therapy. How do you deal with this with patients who come back now is, you know, you get new data, you reflect on old data, and you make changes or realize it just didn't pan out quite the way you'd hoped for. And for women that had been treated in one way who are now going to question and say, but, you know, what's happened to me if it really isn't well, as positive as we'd like right. it to well, be? I, I, specifically with respect to this, I, it wasn't the standard of care, so it wasn't being done um, very frequently. Some, some people are early adopters and the first glimpse of any data that looks positive, they immediately add it to the recipe for treating patients. Uh, I think we always have to be a bit cautious in doing that, not only because there may be other studies that will either support or counter the observation, but there's also the possibility that there might be side effects that weren't appreciated in prior trials. So it's an evolving, we try to convey to patients that the field's evolving, uh, that things we observe in clinical trials or reports we hear at a meeting like this are not necessarily something that we implement on Monday. Uh, they have to undergo a great deal of scrutiny. We have to see the publication. It's not a trying to um, prevent patients from getting what we view as best, but what we think has been rigorously studied so we know it's both effective and safe. So we try and temper enthusiasm and not be overly enthusiastic when it's not appropriate. Dr. Gratishow, this has been a pretty big meeting for HER2 positive patients. It has, and you know, this is a subset of breast cancer. It's an important subset that we would have said not so many years ago represents very aggressive disease. And if you were diagnosed with that, there would be an immediate concern that the behavior was going to be quite aggressive. And uh, the, the entity has not changed, but what has changed is the therapies that we have available for treating it. And um, we heard a number of different presentations earlier today, this afternoon, looking at newer treatments administered preoperatively. And the reason that's important, it gives us a very early hint 
about the activity of a new drug, either alone or in combination with others, because patients get diagnosed, they get it for a brief period of time, and then they go to surgery. So as opposed to evaluating something over a period of years, where we have to wait for the results for five or eight years, you get a very quick look within a period of four to six months, and you can make some judgments about the uh, effectiveness. And the other important point about that, and I'm sure others have made this as well, is a lot of these preoperative trials serve as the template for what we would use postoperatively. And what we've always been trying to do is demonstrate that what we observe preoperatively in that very short time period could be a surrogate for these trials that take years and years and years. So if we could validate that preoperative is the same way that postoperative treatments will look, we could much more quickly advance therapies into patients without waiting five or seven or eight years. Um, with respect to what was shown today, we had a number, we had actually three different oral presentations in HER2 positive disease where uh, treatments were given with chemotherapy along with anti-HER2 therapies, either lapatinib plus trastuzumab or newer therapies like trastuzumab and pertuzumab. And I think the fundamental observation from all those trials without getting into the fine details was that anti-HER2 therapy, number one, complements chemotherapy. Number two, when you use two anti-HER2 therapies as opposed to a single therapy, it seems to have an, a greater effect than just one alone. So they complement each other because they don't work in exactly the same way. And there was also one trial that looked at a non-chemotherapy treatment arm where two anti-HER2 therapies were administered. And although that trial didn't demonstrate a very high likelihood of having a high response rate because chemotherapy wasn't included, I think what was important is that there were a subset of patients who could avoid chemotherapy and actually had the tumor disappear in their breast before surgery, um, roughly 16 to 20 percent of patients. So that's not a home run, but it avoids chemotherapy and I think it really highlights the fact that there might be treatment approaches we might be able to use in some patients that may be equally effective without the side effects. Where is the future for targeted therapies in, in, in breast cancer, personalized medicine? Right. Well, that's a phrase that we all like to use, and it's one that has some grounding now. It was something that we aspired to 10 years ago and would use that phrase all the time. At least now there's some basis for feeling that it has utility and it's real in some patients. I think the challenge is that we have dozens and dozens of drugs, we have dozens of pathways we're trying to target in breast cancer cells. And the key thing is going to be identifying the tumor in a given patient that has a dominant pathway or something that really drives that tumor so that we're not using a shotgun approach. And a perfect example of that is a drug like bevacizumab, which of course, uh, we're going to hear more about later in the week, but that is a drug that we think is very effective in certain patients, but we don't know who they are. And in other words, with... We're uh, speaking about Avastin. Correct. So with respect to hormone receptor positive breast cancer, we know anti-hormone therapy works there. HER2 positive trastuzumab, Herceptin works there. Bevacizumab, we don't know. So I think in order to make personalized medicine a reality for more patients, we have to identify the target. That's going to be the challenge. But I think the reality is we have lots of drugs now, and the challenge for investigators is going to be designing the trials so that we're able to tailor the best medicine for the appropriate tumor. I have a, a curious question. The Human Genome Project, does it have any sort of parallel link or association to now our understanding and our current research in the area of looking at all these pathways and, and the way we're looking at one's individual biology and the molecular components of cancer? Two issues. One is the Human Genome Project obviously identified all the, or was an effort to identify all the genes in an individual. And obviously, uh, with respect to cancer, we're looking at, in a sense, a different genome, the, the genetic makeup of a tumor. So it's a little bit different. But there are parallels because there are normal pathways in both uh, normal cells, uh, abnormal pathways, or cell uh, pathways that can become mutated or abnormal. 
and we just need to leverage and learn how to exploit them. So the outcome of the Human Genome Project in a very simplistic way is we had a much better understanding of molecular biology as opposed to a very crude, you know, very basic picture of a round cell and you hit it with a hammer and everything goes away. The problem, of course, now is that now we still have the round cell, but we've all seen the diagram that it looks like uh, the template for a transistor radio with 500 pathways in it. And it seems that we've come to appreciate how complicated it is. It's also a challenge because there's so many of these pathways that overlap. So it's, it's, it's provided a greater insight into the biology. It's also highlighted the complexity, too. Is that project over, or is there still ongoing no, it's components still, it's of the No, it's still human ongoing, gene? yeah, sure. That's, that's what I thought. So thank you very much, Dr. Gratishar. It's always interesting to talk to you. you. You have a way of putting words, saying it simply for our audience to understand, but there's that little bit of ex excitement to hear, really, that there is a stronger platform, something really tangible to talk about in this new era of personalized medicine. No, I think that's true, and it's my pleasure. Thank you very much, Dr. Bill Gratishar. Thank you very You're much. Welcome.